is Germa. I am the project coordinator for the Museum of Colour. Hello, my name is Sam Anwar and I'm the founder and creative director of Museum of Colour. Um, and this is going to be our monthly chat called Mid-Month Musings, um, where we just talk about three pieces of culture and how they have impacted our lives in the last week or so. So my first piece of culture this week is a book called The Vanishing Half by Britt Bennett. Uh, it was published by Dialogue Books, who um, and the founder of that is Charmaine Lovegrove, who was featured in our People of Letters exhibition. Um, mm. <laughs> so The Vanishing Half is about, without any spoilers, it was about two sis, two twins who can pass as white. One of them decides to pass as white, one of them knows she's black, and so um, passes as black. And it's just about how their lives differ over the course of 40 or so years. Um, and it was just, it was just a really interesting concept because as being a dark skinned black woman, I've never had to pass. I've no, I can't pass as anything other than what I am. And so it was just really interesting to see or to read about how life is so much more different to someone who's identical when you choose to either embrace your identity or to hide your identity and what kind of pitfalls they that allows you to fall into or allows you to move over. Um, so yeah, really interesting, would recommend. Also, it won um, a massive bidding war to be made into TV, a TV series. So that should be happening soon. Um, and I'm really excited to see it because I do, I do think it's a concept that more people need to be aware about, not only in the black community, but also in the white community. So yes, that's my one first piece of culture for the week. Okay, so um, this is not really a question, it's more of an observation because you know I'm slightly obsessed with passing anyway. Yes. If there is a potential research project afoot. Um, but also because I've, in thinking about that project, I've realised that the notion of passing actually goes beyond skin colour. It kind of travels into other areas which are not as obvious and potentially as dramatic as skin colour, but they're there anyway. So I was just wondering, actually this is a question, does she touch on any other notion of passing or is it very specifically the skin colour thing? There are other notions of passing in the book. I will not reveal it because I think everyone should read it, but uh, I think she deals with it beautifully in different different areas of ways that can you can pass in. Um, I hope there was no spoilers in that. No, I don't think there's spoilers in that, but I am like super intrigued. I mean, I'm going to read it anyway. Mm -hmm. um, I haven't read her first book, but I listened to her the other day on, I think it was Radio 4, I think it might have been Start the Week, I don't know, some Radio 4 programme with Gary Young. And the two of them gave the most intelligent reflections on race on the radio that I've heard during this whole uprising during the lockdown moment. And she just sounded so, so intelligent, so thoughtful, so considered in the way that she was responding to, to all sorts of things. I was like, I have to read this woman's writing. Um, so I'm super excited. And now it's got the German stamp of approval. It's just <laughs> a speed really, isn't it? So. Okay, so my first thing, actually, let me go with my book too, because my book couldn't be more different. Paul Spencer's List, and it was about Spencer, and Spencer is a doctor who has lost his partner. His partner left a list of things for him to do when he died. And so Spencer is sort of getting on with this list or not. But then there's a, there's a group of characters around Spencer. So his friend, Fran, who I think is a gardener, um, but she lives in a house with her brother that is literally kind of falling down and that's a really strange situation and then she has a neighbour who has a kind of interesting life she has twins she has teenage twins boys and but she doesn't have much of a life and it is a real slice of life story and it's utterly delightful and I think Mira Sayal did the little recommendation um, on the book and she was just like just buy it just read it and I just thought actually I'm gonna buy it and read it because it it, it it was exactly what I was expecting but it's also kind of poignant and the characters are beautifully drawn and it's so real it's so real and you really empathize and it's what's really beautiful about the way the author Lisa Evans has written this book is it's real and it actually touches on things that are quite sad um, but it's done in a way that you don't feel sad reading it you actually 
feel it's okay to enjoy it and you but what is interesting and this is a bit of a cheat because i'm literally about 95 percent through the book so i haven't actually got to the last page but what has been interesting is since i got to about 80 percent, i have been craving the happy ending now i don't know if i'm going to get one so the way that i'm craving the happy ending is fascinating to me it's like salmon noir just read the book <laughs> but it's it's really lovely and um yeah so it's a lovely read is there um so in the book is it more of we get to know these characters and we see a slice of their life or is it an event-based book where they have to uncover something or that kind of thing what definitely character driven okay. yeah so you get to know the characters and it's a slice of their lives oh. it's lovely So my second piece of culture for this week is the TV series, I May Destroy You, which I think everyone and their mother has talked about. Um, but I just, yeah, just, I am a massive Michaela Cole fan. I've enjoyed her work since Chewing Gum, which was her other TV series, which is on Channel 4 and also on Netflix at the moment. Um, I just think for Chewing Gum, I think she captured a black British experience that I hadn't seen on TV before about being awkward and not fitting in. Um, so I really enjoyed that. And with I May Destroy You, the themes that she touches upon are talked about a lot at the moment. I think she deals with it in a very nuanced way that we don't get to see because discussions only go so far um, and we don't get to see a character's journey because I think the series takes place over a year. So we see the incident and then we see all of the aftermath of it. And that's just, it's just really interesting to see how she deals with it and how her friends deal with it because it's not something that just happens to one person but happens to everyone in the group, I suppose. Um, it's dark, it's heavy, but also got moments of laughter and wit in it. Um, and it's just beautifully written and acted. So that is my second piece of culture. Ooh. Okay, so I'm three episodes in. Okay. So I haven't seen the whole thing. Okay. But... It's really interesting because obviously I am slightly different age <laughs> to the group in the show, only slightly group, but I remember that stage of my life. Um, and uh, with some fond memories and some kind of like, oh dear God, did I do that? Memories as well. So it's quite interesting for me watching it from my perspective. And um, I, first of all, Michaela Cole, I mean, really. There's no superlatives left. We're like, we're done. We're just like, we, we, we don't have anything left to say about the woman. It's just like, just keep making work. Just keep making work. <laughs> keep commissioning this woman's work. She's just brilliant. Um, and, you know, and she's she's brilliant as a conceptualist and as a writer and as, an, as a, but I want to say separately, she's also fantastic as an actor because the stuff that I've seen her in that is not self-penned. Ooh, she, ooh, she's just so good. I'm moving to TV too. Okay. So, um, and actually, I know this isn't the format, but I'm going to do my two together. Okay. And then you will have one left to do. Does Great. that make sense? Yeah, okay. yeah, of course. Anyway, right, I'm breaking the format. <laughs> Story of my life. It's there to be broken. Yeah, there you go. So, um, very Museum of Colour. Breaking the format. Yay! Um, so, the first one I'm going to talk about is Penny Dreadful City of Angels. I never watched any of the Penny Dreadfuls. It appealed to me because it was dealing with um, Santa Muerte. Now I'm really interested in different cultures' approaches to death and yeah, how we all sort of deal with it. So I was very interested because it flagged that it was going to feature Santa Muerte and and give, you know, give some peeks into that part of Mexican culture. Hmm. But what the show actually does is it gives a more interesting take, basically. It's set in Los Angeles, 1938. There's the Santa Muerta character who is not in it very much, which is kind of disappointing. The one who is in it very much is her sister, who I do not know if she's fictional or not. Obviously she's fictional in the show, but I don't know if the notion of Santa Muerte actually, whether she actually has a sister. The idea is, is that Santa Muerte looks after the dead. Yeah, she's the goddess of the dead. And um, and she sort of sees you through your passage. And if you pray to her, she takes care of you on your passage or she takes care of those 
around you on their passage. The idea is that she has a sister and her sister is like the death lover. Yeah, so the sister is just like, <laughs> and the sister believes that humans are evil. And the sister go makes it her business to prove just how evil humans are. And in this series, the sister is played by Natalie Dormer. Hmm, slightly controversial because I don't believe she's very Mexican. Um, maybe not even slightly controversial, controversial end. Um, and but the sister, but in the in the show she plays quite brilliantly. I've got to be honest. Three characters where this let's prove they're as evil as they really are theme. She plays it out in three characters across the ten episodes in this series. So conceptually, it's actually really interesting. And because it's set in 1938, it is fascinating time in, in California, Los Angeles, because it's Hollywood heyday. Um, and yeah, yeah, it's and, and there's a Mexican family at the heart of it. And the way that this story plays out with all the different family members, fascinating. Definitely a flawed series from my perspective. Um, the, the Natalie Dormer character is fascinating and a brilliant I can see how the writers just, you know, enjoyed using this as a stimulus for drama, but slightly concerned as to whether it is true to the Mexican ideas that it's borrowing from. I don't know whether it is because I'm not Mexican and I don't know it well enough. Um, so that slightly bothered me, not knowing, not being sure if it was authentic, um, but it was enjoyable and it was interesting. And the story does wind and there's Nazis in it. and. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a decent watch, it's a decent watch. The reason I'm gonna go straight into my third watch is because they're kind of linked. So I'm having this historical USA moment um, because the one that I, the second the second television drum that I wanna talk about is based on a novel. Star, well, it's starring lots of people, but the ones that I knew were John Turturro, who I'm a big fan of, and Winona Ryder. And it basically tells an alternative story of um, America through the eyes of a working class Jewish family. And the, the, the alternate moment is a war moment, which has the Nazis. That's why there's the link. So the alternate moment is that instead of Roosevelt winning the election and taking America into the Second World War, he loses and Lindbergh wins on the premise that he doesn't take America into the Second World War. So actually going to war is something that is banned by Americans. And of course, anti-Semitism grows throughout America. I'm not saying that it's not there now, but it grows in a completely different way through this alternative route in history. And the two characters that were most interesting to me were the two um, that were played by John Turturro and Erna Ryder. John Turturro is a, plays a rabbi who gets sucked into the Limburgh field. He supports Limburgh, but Limburgh must be a Nazi sympathizer as, uh, as why else would he keep America out of the war? So why would this rabbi allow himself to be caught up in the slipstream? So he's kind of vain, he kind of enjoys the power, it, they talk about integration, and the Winona Ryder character plays the sister of the woman that's in the working class Jewish family that it's based on, but she's, kind, she's the one looking after the mother who um, has dementia, and she's not married. And it's clear that this is a bit of an issue. And then she meets the rabbi character, they get it on, and then she gets sort of caught up in his slipstream and she's excited about the fact that she's marrying, she's marrying this, this charismatic rabbi, and then she gets all caught up in it as well. And they're both, the portrayals are beautifully done. Um, now also this series, and in this way it's really different from The Penny Dreadful, is David Simon. David Simon, and he makes masterful television. The attention to detail, um, you know, I believe there's some bits he got wrong when he came to England, but in this in this series, but it, it's just gorgeous. It's just gorgeous. And oh, I loved every episode and I wanted more. What was really interesting to me for the two 
is that one was featuring the Jewish experience, the other was featuring the Mexican experience and watching both of them in this lockdown uprising moment, it was really interesting to see the playbook. The playbook is the same. The playbook, whether you are African-American, whether you are Mexican, whether you are Jewish, whatever it is, the playbook of difference and the threat of difference, the same. And, and I think, especially because we're doing this post Wiley meltdown on social media moment, that sense of how one group can, who experience disadvantage in a societal sense, can then have prejudice against other groups who also experience disadvantage in a societal sense. Um, and how strange that is for some to understand, but how easy it is for us to understand because the idea of equality is we're all exactly the same, i.e. we are as good at all as shit as everybody else. Um, is really interesting and it's really played out well through these two shows. Okay, I'll stop there, but they're both worth watching. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, what was it called? You never said. Oh gosh, it was called The Plot, the plot Against America. The Plot go. Against America. Plot Against America. Um, okay, so my third piece of culture this week was, it's a series of workshops, but um, so I'm going to say it counts. Uh, it's by Utopia Theatre and they are doing a series of masterclasses and workshops and conversations about being a black artist or being a person of African descent and being an artist, um, which I think is brilliant. I think it, it came what I first saw it after the Black Lives Matter moment that's happening at the moment. Um, and so I went to my first one yesterday, which was Natalie Ibu and Bolahan Obisesan in conversation with each other. So they are two artist directors of theatres in London. So Natalie Ibu is the artist director of Theatre for Whimsy, um, and Bolahan Obisesan is the incoming artist director of Brixton House, which used to be old Oval House. And it was just really interesting to have, to listen to those two, one of the only two, Black artist directors of, of theatre in London or in England, um, talking about their experiences and what they what they want from the work that they that they produce and create, and what the struggles that they've overcome. Because I think it's again we don't really see people's struggle stories. Um, they're very much hidden, and especially in theatre, it's it's very much like I am a successful bloody blah, and so I'm not going to talk about what I did before. It's all just been an uphill trajectory. And so it was really interesting to listen to their experiences of struggling with identity, about being black and being okay, being um, theatre being the place for them to be. Um, it was just really interesting and exp in inspiring because theatre is my other half of my heart. Um, so I am always interested to hear what like leaders in my industry have to say. So that is my third piece of culture and they are going on until October. So I think if you Google Utopia Theatre, you can find stuff out about them. But oh yes, yeah. plug, plug, plug. That sounds utterly fascinating and I'm definitely going to have a look. And it's interesting because you say, oh gosh, I did a piece of work for the Bush and Battersea Arts Centre, I think in 2018, I think it was I was doing it. And it was a really interesting moment because while I was doing that piece of work, both artistic directors of both venues left. <laughs> so they both recruited <laughs> new artistic directors. Um, and interestingly that both new artistic directors were people of colour and the new incoming, um, one outgoing and one not. And it, it was really interesting. So I wrote a little blog post that kind of disappeared about when is too much, when is enough. And yeah, and it was just, it was just a really interesting thought, you know? Um, yeah, it's just, it was just a really interesting thought. and. Yeah, I, I'm going to just leave that there. Um, but thank you for that. I'm quite excited about the Bricks. What's it called? Brixton House. I was going to say the Brixtonian, but that'll be the <laughs> wine bar down the road. Oops. Um, yeah, featured very heavily in my Michaela Cole life. Anyway, <laughs> <laughs> um, so Brixton House. Well, of course, because it's moved from Oval to Brixton, so that yeah. makes that makes complete sense. That is a, that is a really good renaming. But anyway, I'll keep an eye out for it. So thanks for that, Gemma. You're very welcome. Hi. So I think we're both signing off, aren't we? We are. Um, thank you for listening to our mid-month musings. We should have Yay. a theme tune. We will be back. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Bye.